very happy to welcome all of you on behalf of IDSK to uh, start off the program I would like to invite our director Professor Indrani Chakraborty to come and say a few words please Welcome everyone to our foundation lecture we are glad to have one of the cameras seen that for eminence scholar in the field of development he is also the director of development economic program mm -hmm. and before we start, I briefly present the program of IDSK since its inception. IDSK was promoted by the government of Washington Gulf as an autonomous and humanities in India. In 2014, the Indian Council of Social Science Research recognized IDSK under the new category of ICSSI recognized institutes. IDSK is de devoted to advanced academic research and informed policy advice in the areas of education, health, gender, employment, technology, industry, communication, governance, human sciences, and economic development. In 2010, IDSK shifted to its new campus at Salt Lake. Eminent scholars including Amartya Sen, Joseph Stiglitz, James Marlis, Martha Nusbam, Swami Ramin, and others visited IDSK and gave lectures since its inception. IDSK has actively collaborated with a good number of academic institutions in India and abroad. Its close association with the University of Calcutta started since its inception. Over the last 21 years, total publication by IDSK faculty includes 43 books, 78 occasional papers, and numerous Some of them have passed career outside the academy So it is a glorious and wonderful journey that made it possible for IDSK to establish its reputation as a renowned institution in the field of development studies in India and abroad. We gratefully acknowledge the far-reaching vision and contributions of Professor Amyo Bhakti. I now invite Dr. Shupuna to introduce Professor um, thank you, Anjanidhi. I would now invite uh, Professor Moitrish Ghatok and Professor Omiyo Bhakti to please come up on stage. Uh, They will now be welcomed by Shuchandra, our PhD student, uh, with flowers.
Thank you, Shuchandra. Uh, before I introduce Professor Ghatok, I would request everybody in the audience to please keep their phones on silent. Um, Professor Motrish Ghatok is Professor of Economics at London School of Economics. He is also the Director of the Development Economics Program, STICERT, and the Director of the MRES PhD Program, Department of Economics. He is the co-editor of Economica and Ideas for India. Previously, he was the editor-in-chief of Journal of Development Economics. A fellow of the British Academy, Professor Ghatok was educated in Presidency College, Delhi School of Economics, and Harvard University. He has been associated with Oxford University, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and Stanford University in various visiting positions. He has authored numerous papers in top journals of economics, such as American Economic Review, Economics Journal, Journal of Economic Development Economics, and Quarterly Journal of Economics. His areas of specialization are development economics, organizational economics, and public economics. Professor Ghatok also writes regularly in NDTV.com, The Hindustan Times, Anand Bajar Potrika, The Indian Forum, The Wire, and Ideas for India. It is our great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ghatok. Uh, he will now be felicitated by Professor Bhakji um, uh, and uh, by Sean Chaiti. Um, I now request the director, Professor uh, Chakraborty, to felicitate Professor Bhakti. So now with all of the formalities done, we will start off with the lecture. Uh, like I said before, please keep your phones on silent, Professor. Um, Gautok will speak for 45 minutes, one hour, and then we'll have the question answers and everything. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be invited to deliver this uh, lecture, which uh, the list of previous lecturers are truly uh, uh, many, many eminent economists and, uh, and uh, other scholars from the humanities and social sciences. Uh, it's also genuinely um, uh, humbling and a um, lot of pleasure to see professors of former professors and various members of economic fraternity in Kolkata and, and, and friends in this room. So what I'm going to do today, uh, the, some of the themes I'll mention would not come as very surprising to you because they, they are kind of in our broad thinking about whatever is going on with the Indian economy. What I will try to do in the next, uh, let's see if this works. Sorry for. Uh, what I'm going to do today is really ask a broad question about the slowdown of the growth uh, process in India that became visible well before the pandemic, starting around 2016. That's sort of a macro question that many have wondered about and formed views about. And I also want to embed in this broader question, uh, what is happening with poverty? What is the situation with poverty? Normally, this would be a short talk because I would just present the NSS estimates out of the 2017-18 survey and be done with it. But the reason this would require a fair bit of work is because some of the statistics were not published. Uh, uh, people have had to find various indirect methods to uh, go at it. And some of the research contribution in terms of the work I'm doing here would be uh, related to that. But I want to embed that, of course, in the bigger picture question about what, how does it fit in with the broader question about the macroeconomic uh, slowdown in India. 
So I have to give up on the clicker because I think for some reason it's not working. But that should be OK. Uh, so I want to, some of the work I'll present here is very recent work that I'm doing with uh, Rishav Kumar of UMass Boston, who did his PhD at UMass Amherst and former JNU student, uh, who has worked a fair bit on inequality in India. And I want to focus on what's going on in the last decade in terms of growth, inequality, and poverty, but again, put it in the long-term perspective of what's been going on, not just since the liberalization, but from the 80s. You know, where is there a change in the trend? Where is there a change in the pattern? Now, the hypothesis uh, that we are going to work with, and this is a hypothesis uh, that has been advanced by many, in, in, including Professor Bagchi from some of his early work in the 60s and 70s stagnation debate, is basically the interconnectedness between uh, the demand composition, income inequality, and the factor returns that are thereby generated, which can kind of create a vicious cycle. So if there's a particular pattern of growth that benefits a certain group, their demand composition then affects the demand for other factors, but to the extent those factors are not spread in the economy in a way it can pull up unskilled wages or generate employment opportunities there, the typical kind of growth is a, a tide that lift, uh, will lift all boats, that mechanism will not work. So I will also present evidence that some of the recent kind of um, some of the more recent uh, debates about what's the status of poverty in India has created an impression, at least in certain uh, policy circles, that there has actually been a sharp decline in poverty. In fact, uh, the World Bank uh, website, which uh, has one of the reliable uh, time series uh, data on poverty, which until the recent uh, year uh, was based on the NSS Consumer Expenditure Surveys, um, also report some of these numbers, where just to give you an example where the uh, year that a lot of discussion has surrounded is 2017-18, which would be about six, seven years after uh, the uh, previous one, it is put at less than 10%. Uh, this is extreme poverty using the World Bank line on extreme poverty. Now, since the 2011-12 number was about 21%. If this is true, then it would be quite an achievement to have this kind of a drop in six, seven years. Now, I'm going to make the case, you know, I, you know, we have our gut feelings, and I'm sure all of you have your views about the plausibility of this, and I can also guess which direction most of your views will go, but still, one would have to do some actual number crunching to evaluate this number, and look at other statistics that, for example, is it consistent with the share of agriculture? Is it consistent with what is going on in the labor market, et cetera, et cetera, to really try to put a plausible interval about what is happening to poverty, okay? And once again, I think, while interesting academically, I cannot um, uh, you know, help wondering that this would not be such an elaborate exercise if simply the statistics were available and we could then debate whatever the methodological, uh, alleged methodological problems with it which caused the government not to release these numbers. So what I'll do now is I will present a broad snapshot of the Indian economy. Uh, which is uh, largely focused on growth, investment, exports, et cetera, as to what's happening in terms of tailwinds for the economy, uh, things that could create growth impulses. Then I'll present some numbers on inequality. Then I'll present one of the kind of things we contribute uh, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to this literature. I'll present some income group-specific growth rates, because growth rate is an average number. And I'll keep on coming back to saying that even if your growth rate is 10%, it may not mean a lot as to what's happening uh, to the living standards of the um, uh, l large uh, populations. Uh, one can create simple arithmetic examples of if 10% you know, of the population is growing at, say, 10% you know, a year and 90% is not growing at all, you're still going to get a growth rate of 1%, which for the whole population, and that will be misleading, okay? But again, this is in this audience, I th don't think that point needs to be belabored. So this is my first graph. Uh, it's um, hopefully visible from the back. Is it visible from the back? So, are you borrow the word?
No, ever be rejected. So again, uh, there's nothing here that uh, that in some ways a little bit of uh, 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 work uh, w any of us uh, wouldn't be able to generate. But what I have shown here is is kind of numbers that go back as far as 1960, from which the World Bank uh, spreadsheet gives us comparable uh, uh, numbers. So we have these uh, different bars there. So in the top panel where the, you have the blue curve, this is just the level of GDP per capita. Okay, and that's it. And in the bottom, we actually have the growth rates. So they obviously correspond to each other. So when it's going up, you know, the green one means it's, a, it's an increase, and the red bars means that, you know, in that year there was a negative growth and so on. So it's a compact way of presenting uh, both the level and the rate of growth of uh, per capita income. And what's interesting here, I, you know, is that fact that there was indeed a spike in the growth rate starting the uh, early 90s, okay? And it was kind of visible even in the 80s, if you, if you look at that curve. You know, before that, it's quite flat, right? But the real spike came in the 2000 to 2010 period. And after that, again, there is a little bit of a, a decline in the trend uh, of the growth rates. And you can see that from the green bars that it's only in the very, uh, the one that is to the left of the, uh, you know, more, uh, extreme uh, right panel, where the green bars look kind of healthy and long, okay? So that's where the yearly growth rates were looking good. And indeed, there are some debates about national income statistics measurement that I will come to, but this is the broad picture. Now, this is something that I've already said that, um, there are these national income related debates, and I'm sorry, uh, and some of these I'm presenting here. This is from a recent um, uh, paper by R. Nagaraj. So here, this is a smaller uh, period over which I'm doing a you know, zooming on, which is from 2012-13 to 2019-20, uh, right? And you have the blue curve is the official growth rate, and you can see the evidence for the stagnation that started around 2016-17. The curve is going down, and this is the growth rate. Now, what that orangish uh, flat line is, is alternative estimates that um, uh, Arvind Subramaniam and Sebastian Morris and others have done, uh, essentially pointing out to some methodological changes in the national income statistics. Now, to be fair, those are controversial, and I am willing to believe more of the critiques in terms of what's happening. But it's also true that if that is the case, it would at most bump down the growth rate one time or two time, but it would not make a sustained, unless you keep on doing it, it would not create a sustained difference in the growth rate. But still, the bump does matter if you're looking at the average growth rate during the period, right? So th therefore, there are solid reasons to believe that there is some exaggeration there. Now, with that broad picture, now I want to come back to more thinking like an economist or, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a policy uh, a person interested in policy, that, you know, why should care about growth, right? I mean, if we want to take uh, Shukanto Bhattacharya's famous poem, good for them, right? And to the extent she gari toiri hoche, she gari jonanik chakri hoche, Shetaro Hoytu maybe it's good for growth, but how is it going to affect the rest of the economy? So therefore, we should care about growth other than, okay, it's good for those who are experiencing it, not for the others, only if there's an impulse of the growth transmits through the body of the economy and generates ripples of growth elsewhere. That's where you can make kind of an instrumental argument that I can see that why growth will eventually, like a wave, it'll, it'll uh, positively impact uh, various uh, segments of the economy and even have an impact potentially on poverty. So one thing is this is very basic supply and demand, that there's a demand side linkage that those whose incomes are growing due to say a growth upsurge, whether it's an export software export boom of the 90s and the early 2000s, whatever it is, their incomes are growing up, they're demanding a set of things and that is creating domestic demand. And this demand then would again create some factor incomes which were not uh, you know, uh, present before. They will be spending again and you can have a sort of virtuous cycle of spending and growth. And then there's also the supply side linkage that demand for these factors of production would raise, say, wages or create more employment and returns to skill acquisition would go up and then this income growth would then feed to the demand channel. So if things are in sync, then this could be a harmonious process. 
Now, if you think about at a more micro level, how does this growth impulse spread to the economy? One way you, it's visibly happens is urbanization and migration. This is, would be an example in which this wave of growth, you know, initial growth shock would then create ripples in the economy, and through that, people would be then taking advantage of that. Firms would be increasing investment, anticipating demand growth. Remittances would help people who are migrating either domestically or abroad. They would be sending some of their incomes back to their uh, uh, you know, homes. And also, ideally, it's not the ideal world we live in, but ideally it should also create growth in tax revenue and investment in public health, education, and social safety net. So these are the ways in which growth is good uh, unless it is really concentrated. It's a more enclave kind of growth process. Okay? And then, of course, it's a textbook thing. If people save and invest, then individuals can then take advantage of the growth opportunities that keep coming. Now let's look at what's happening to the potential growth impulses, because this is when happens if there's some kind of a big wave that could sort of start creating these ripples. This is investment to GDP ratio. I don't want to belabor the point, but it's fairly obvious that starting around 2016, uh, there's been a kind of sharp uh, decline, and it has never really recovered. And this is you know, investment as a, as a fraction of GDP. And this is an alarming picture. Whatever you think of the growth rates, this is an alarming picture. Firms or corporates are not investing, at least in proportion to the GDP. Exports, why not exports? Why not be like East Asia? Why not you know, follow their model? Yeah, in principle, yes, if you can do it, that would create, again, some, some uh, growth uh, impulses that could benefit the rest of the economy. But here, the record of the last decade is not looking good. So this is exports as a function of GDP. As you can see, that there was an initial increase up to around 20, uh, 2010. And after that, uh, you know, uh, there's been a steady decline. Yeah? And again, it's a ratio. So it's not like absolute exports are not growing. It's in the ratio of, of to GDP. Now, this is more a summary one. So if you look at the structure of aggregate demand and basic macroeconomic kind of textbook stuff, uh, the black line there is consumption, the red one is investment, and the green one is net exports, that is exports minus imports, right? That are various sources of demand. And again, the point I try to make is not to give you a macro, you know, a preliminary macro lecture, but to say something is happening in the last decade, and these are official stats that are showing it. So it is not somebody pulling up different statistics or some kind of a leftist critique of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, growth strategy of the present government. Sorry. It, so basically, there's a signs of slackening demand are apparent over the last de de decade. And yet, if you look at the current government's policies, you will basically see that this is a very supply side view. They basically think that various kind of incentives uh, would essentially prompt the private sector to increase their investment, right? Whether it is, you know, all the schemes you look at, whether it's the GST reduction in the corporate tax, too many schemes, too many PM, ex Jojonas, you know, that it, it is difficult to fit into one, one slide. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, you can go on and on. But whatever their merits, demerits, the main problem is these are supply side measures, right? So you're basically trying to push, but if the string is broken, pushing a string does not, is very effective. You need the pull of the demand, okay? And that, that's going to be my main point. And indeed, you can li if you read the pink papers, the business papers, and interviews of various corporate heads, there is reluctance to you know, undertake massive investments, et cetera. And the main reason people give is that they're not seeing a sustained increase in the market size, and especially coming from the rural areas. This is just the, what comes out in the media. So essentially, Whatever sector is experiencing the exogenous growth spurt, those whose incomes are directly affected always constitute a relatively small part of the overall labor force. And therefore, what would be for this kind of a demand shock, even that could be boosted, would only make sense if their expenditure patterns then boost the demand for goods and services that are more intensive in factors that the poor have more of, which would be unskilled labor. 
right? So that's the kind of, uh, when most of the growth would occur in the top layer of the population, then the demand for an existing industry does not grow that much. So this is really, could be a reason why corporates are reluctant to expand their investment, because it's not like if you look at the numbers, there are sections of the economy that are growing. The luxury sector is growing just fine. But the whole point is, if you think of the economy as a, you know, and at the risk of mixing many metaphors here, if you think of this as a big train, the engine of growth needs to be connected with the other compartments, and if those connecting kind of you know, cords are getting weaker and weaker, it's simply not able to move much when it chugs along, right? Now, essentially the problem is, we all know, that the rich proportionally save more, the poor proportionally consume uh, more, right? And if you look at some of the numbers from the CMI uh, consumer pyramids data, which unfortunately for many of us has become the go-to database for consumer expenditures since the NSS numbers are not being published regularly, and it does have sample representativeness issues that I will you know, come back to. But still, the fact is 60% of India's consumer expenditure is on food and energy. So therefore, the basic kind of income levels that this would imply can be kind of you know, inferred easily from that. And essentially, um, uh, the, um, um, uh, you know, for bottom half of the population, this proportion it goes up to even to 70%. It's basically food and fuel, right? So the question is, the propensity to spend, though, is another story, and that's where I want to come to, right? So their average may be, you know, expenditure uh, may be high, but these are on more basic items. But if income growth happens, they're more likely to spend the incremental income on things, and then the goods and services could go up some kind of a channel or the ladder of how skilled or how, how sophisticated the products are, et cetera. So indeed, the richer a household, the higher is the savings rate, and expenditure elasticities for richer consumers are lower than for the bottom 50% of rural consumers, and for all goods and services, other than appliances and EMIs, recreation, etc. For whole range of mass consumer goods, except for this upper end, the marginal propensity to consume of the poorer sections are actually higher. So this is something to keep in mind, right? Now, these items clearly have greater value added by skilled workers and are typically produced in the organized sector, the last item, the more luxury items that the rich consume. And this essentially lies behind the vicious cycle story that has been a motive in what you're saying. And in a separate presentation in this uh, city uh, last week, I presented some formal models that shows how this sort of the demand side and the supply side uh, are connected, right? So the question, therefore, is, the rural folks, if they have additional income, and if poverty is declining sharply, according to some estimates, that must be happening, why isn't the demand showing up? Where is the missing demand? Why is it happening? Of course, a simple answer is that the income of the poor are not growing, and that's why not the, the demand is not showing up. And that is the hypothesis that I will find uh, evidence for. So we still, we have to question you know, what, what, what's really going on in terms of the poorer sections. So now I want to move to the third part of uh, uh, the set of statistics I want to show, and then uh, at the risk of not to uh, make you, uh, your head heavy with too, too much uh, dry statistics, there only will be the poverty-related numbers that I'll present, and, and that, 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 that's the plan for, for the talk. So here I want to show some of the inequality-related numbers, because growth, consumption expenditure, savings, these are all connected in the underlying sense, in a dynamic sense, through the income distribution. Because growth generates the incomes, income generates the spending patterns, but through savings and other things, that generates the income distribution, and it feeds back into the uh, kind of growth process. So this is the dynamics we have to keep in mind. And again, the numbers here, or the broad discussion around them, would not come as a surprise to you that there has been a rise, sharp rise in inequality. So this is the wealth concentration since the 1990s. So from, and this is Piketty and his leadership at the World Inequality Database uh, with which uh, the numbers that, that uh, we have used. And you can see that the green one is for the bottom 50% and the black one uh, is for the uh, top 1%. And you can see that there is clear divergence going on in terms of the economic fate 
of the very top and the rest of the economy. And I want to keep on coming, I hopefully, you know, with clarity, this late motive that will be in my talk, that something is clearly positive going on in the top 1%, even top 10% of the economy. And that's what the newspapers focus on, and that's where the average growth numbers are coming from. That may be true, despite the exaggerations. But the question is, so what? What is it doing to the rest of the economy in terms of pulling incomes up, creating demand, and so on? Okay. This is just a comparison with the rest of the world. I'll go through quickly, but once again, the point is not inequality is present in every country. There's something that has happened in wealth inequality in India that stands out even when you look at it in international perspective, right? Now, the causes and consequences are a different matter of discussion, but the raw statistics are pretty clear that even in a global comparison, whether with comparable economies or with developed economies, this is clearly the case. Now, this is, uh, let me try to blow it up a bit. So this is income inequality. So this is where the Piketty uh, and his colleagues database has done a lot of useful and innovative data work by combining NSS numbers with income tax numbers and making certain statistical assumptions to actually generate income inequality over time. And the reason it might be to the layperson will say, what's the big deal, you know, income inequality, income should be easily measured. The point is we have national income statistics and then you have consumer expenditures. So there is no regular income data for in, in terms of households and individuals. Therefore, creating such a distribution itself is kind of something that, that is a contribution and that's useful. So once again, I think the interesting thing to look at is that the top 10% share, you can see it's in the blue, the bottom 50% is basically the red, the middle 40% is the gray one, and then the top 1% is uh, the, uh, sorry, sorry, is the orange one, the top 1%. And once again, uh, it reminds me of uh, what when we were taught Russian economic history, the scissors crisis because of the price of agriculture sector and industry kind of flipped. You can see a bit of a scissor pattern going on uh, roughly around this time. So, oh, this is not working. But roughly around the point of uh, 2010, there is a little bit of a reversal of pattern going on, that inequality has actually gone up more uh, than the broader pattern that was holding. Now, this is how the other half uh, lives. It's kind of a picture that shows um, essentially vulnerable uh, employment. This is an ILO-generated uh, 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 number, which is very useful, and I'll give you the detailed uh, definition a bit later. And then you have the dash line, which gives us undernourished percentage of the population. And you can see that, you know, that picture is consistent with this other picture where we do not see any significant change. It's, if anything, there was some decline up to 2010, and you could ar argue that Narega and other things might have played a role for that. Of course, that has to be established, and this is a conjecture. But after that, there's been a bit of a flat pattern. So when is growth inclusive? So in some ways, I think the whole theme of this is when will the engine of growth, if you literally think of the analogy of a train engine, will be able to pull along all the compartments and ideally people will then move from one compartment to another, which would be mobility. That would be kind of a positive vision of inclusive growth. So essentially, any autonomous increase in the incomes of the bottom five rural deciles would create subsequent spending cycles for goods produced by low skill and hence low wage workers, right? And this will then generate a bottom up growth that would sustain for a long time. Okay, so that could be something if one were to be able to generate those income. Just to give you an example, because of this whole public policy debate about the reverie culture, which basically means that the poor are always, you know, asking for handouts, right? Where the bank write-offs and the pay commission, you know, salary hikes, these are ignored as those are handouts too. Uh, you know, bank write-offs or the loan write-offs are essentially, um, those are things that defaults that are largely done by the richer sections, but leaving that aside, this would be a prime facie case of having those, you know, Keynesian style transfers to the poorer section that could then create a bottom-up process of growth. So the engine, the you know, the end compartments would then have some traction coming even from their side, okay? So that could be one way and, and you know, this would be the kind of, you know, the uh, vision of how uh, this growth uh, uh, process could then try to pull all the compartments. 
And this is basically, you know, with these uh, set of uh, statistics that I showed you, this would be our maintained hypothesis. Something is happening to the external demand sources, and then that is creating a growth process that is benefiting some, as the inequality numbers are showing, but it's not really making a huge amount of difference to even 90% of the population. You saw what's happening to the bottom 50, what's happening to the middle 40, and then that only leaves the top 10, right? So not much is happening there. There's a recent paper um, essay by Vivek Kaul in the India uh, Forum, where basically he looks at some specific goods and services and their demand patterns over the last five to seven years. And he actually has you know, some numbers on things like mass consumption goods, like two-wheelers, small entry-level cars, train travel, etc., fast-moving consumer goods, everyday use items from toothpaste to soap, especially in rural areas, and this is a market share that's declining. So here I'm, other than the general macro pictures, I'm trying to provide some flesh to the story that something is happening in the demand composition or the demand you know, pattern that is coming from the rural sections where incomes are uh, not, not uh, uh, growing very much. And indeed, if you look at the demand for Narega, the budgetary allocation for Narega is another issue, but the demand for Narega is clearly going up and up. So if the rural sector was thriving, this would not be happening. So I did some work, and here I won't spend that much time on it, but still it's interesting because it fits in with the general research agenda I have here. As I said, that we have to move away from this aggregate growth numbers. You know, these days I have to use them when they come out, but I almost like, you know, this is, you know, as much as I'm not interested that much in the weather of some distant city in some distant country, you know, the growth rate, aggregate growth rate really doesn't tell me anything. Right? I mean, it tells me something, but unless I have more information, I really don't know whether I should be delighted or I should be indifferent, right? So with my PhD student, Lin Chuan Shu, what I've done is come up with a simple methodology where we can use the pick, uh, world income inequality database to actually create growth rates by income groups. So you have the average growth rate that the national income statistics will give you, but I can also track the change in the share of income, say the top 10%. Since I have it for two years, yeah, I know how much their relative income change, but I also know how much overall income change, so I can back out and calculate what their growth rate would be. It's a simple one, but you can operationalize it and do some calculations pretty simply. Okay, I don't know how much of it is uh, see, you know, uh, clear, visible from the back, but first, if you focus, so first of all, these are growth rates. So zero is the natural lower bound, and what you have here are basically, so 0 0.08 would mean 8%, et cetera. That's the vertical axis. And then you have the years from 1995 to 2014, where you know, uh, these, these growth rates are being presented on an annual basis. So first, I know it looks like some kind of a, uh, you know, um, a modern uh, piece of modern art uh, or computer, what, I don't know what, what's called digital art. But, um, you know, but if you look at the blue line or the blue whatever jagged line, that is the average growth rate. That's your friendly everyday media reported growth rate. And if you link it back to the earlier figures I showed on the growth rates, that's the blue line. Okay, that's the average. Without needing to strain your eyes too much, just focus on the red one, the one on the top since 1995. Yeah? It beats the blue line by a fair distance. That is the growth rate of the top 1%. So here, we actually have a kind of measure, which of course you can also, I could report the numbers. So you can see that the red line actually is strictly above this until about uh, 2013 or 2015 or so. And after that, um, uh, some of the policies of the current government, you could argue in terms of demonetization, whatever, you know, et cetera. Actually, even the top 1% growth rate has gone down a bit, but it still lies above the growth rate of the average income. 
no economics textbook will tell you this should happen. Because typically speaking, the richer you are, the scope for growing more is less. It's the classic thing. If it's a student already has 95 out of 100, for that student, can't even increase his or her marks by 10%. It's an impossibility. But a student who has gotten, I don't know, 30, uh, raising the marks by 10% should be fairly straightforward and not really you know, worth, worth commenting that much. So this is the main thing I want to say, that the bottom 50% is represented by the green one, and they are systematically below. So this is the usefulness of this graph, that we have the average, the blue, and it is, they are correlated because they are extrapolated out of the average numbers, but we are using the income share change to figure out the extra bounce or the extra dip that's happening. And this is kind of the pattern that we see, that there is an inequalizing process. In most of the time periods, the top 1% experience the highest growth rates compared to the other groups, and ever-increasing gap between the top income group and the rest of the population, right? So this is the basic story. Now, I want to keep on, you know, not to get, you know, throw too many macro statistics and things at you. Because my main puzzle is what's happening with poverty. And even if I think about some of the reported numbers that say Sujit Bhalla and co-authors or Sutito Sena Roy and Van der Weyde at the World Bank have computed, right? Even if you take them at their face value, they're showing sharp drugs. I'm just trying to make sense out of that. Okay, that if this is what's happening to the growth rates, where is this coming from? Is it some you know, aliens from UFOs dropping stuff and then somehow that's getting picked up or whatever? That's really the puzzle I want to uh, think about and connect all this to. So now I come to the third and final part of my, my discussion. So I want to understand the trends in poverty over the last decade in the absence of data. In fact, Rishav and I debated as to what we should title we should use for this, you know, uh, uh, hopefully will be a circulable paper soon. Should we call it the poverty of statistics and the statistics of poverty? We for now chose the growth, you know, growing apart one, but we might actually revert to that, uh, to uh, bow to Marx. Okay, so I want to look at, again, all I'm doing here, think about a courtroom drama or a murder mystery, I'm just compiling a bunch of circumstantial evidence because nobody in the end really knows what happened to the poverty numbers. So unless the NSS report can be you know, dug out and made publicly available, then maybe subject to all the sampling controversies we would exactly know. So we are just trying to see or figure out what really happened to it. So, Another set of things that I will not necessarily present everything in great detail to you because you have hopefully gotten the broad drift of it. So our basic point is, see, if whatever is the growth rate, whatever is the rate at which the poor are growing, it's still not zero. It's not like no growth is happening, yeah? And indeed, in developed countries, they would be happy with some of the growth rates even that the poorer sections are enjoying, right? But the question is, if this growth is happening, what is happening to structural transformation? Is it something that, you know, do we see some supporting evidence that we look at share of agriculture? Because we know with economic development, there should be greater movement from, you know, individuals and resources from agriculture to industry to services. Well, here are some numbers. So basically, the green one is agriculture. Uh, the red one is manufacturing and the black one is services, right? So you can see that the agricultural share is fairly flat since 2010. And indeed, it marginally experienced an increase during the pandemic period when a lot of people just moved back from urban areas in the service sector back to the rural areas, right? So in the first part of the picture from 1980, this is consistent with what Kuznets, Rostow, everybody, you know, all the sort of, you know, arguments of structural transformation and the stylized facts, it is along the lines what we would expect. But after that, you see an increasing stagnation in agriculture. It kind of stayed flat. Manufacturing has gone down marginally, and services have improved, okay? And this is the interesting thing here. So if poverty is going down, and most of the poor live in rural areas, what's going on? This is employment composition, again, agricultural services, manufacturing, construction. I will not bore you with describing the graphs, but it kind of picks up a similar story of initially following the pattern of what you would expect, 
but then there's a flattening. If you look at the labor force participation as well as the employment population ratio, once again, in a thriving economy, you should see a thriving labor market. You may well argue that these are not the great jobs you want people to have in a good development model. That's a different debate. But at least you will see some you know, activity and energy in the labor market. If you look at these curves, once again, it is not consistent with a very thriving labor market. And indeed, one of the things that I'm sure many of you have been following the debates, that urban female labor participation rate, and in particular female labor participation rate kind of hitting such low levels, is one of the genuine puzzles that has, one has to uh, really grapple with, because it will have macroeconomic implications, which it surely is having. So not a lot happening here that would suggest things are changing for the better for the bulk of the population. So this is the case I'm trying to build. Perhaps you already uh, you know, uh, instinctively uh, felt that that was going on, but that was my task here to present a set of you know, evidence where this, this is backed up by data. So now I come to the actual poverty numbers. And I promise not to bore you again with too much of the sausage making, the details of which survey, which extrapolation, etc. So there are these recent working papers from the IMF uh, and then the World Bank that suggest there's been a sharp reduction in extreme poverty uh, from 2011-12 to 2017-18. Uh, the IMF working paper, which frankly, at this point, nobody uh, is taking very seriously for some serious methodological issues, which I'll point out. But the World Bank study is actually a thorough one. If you read the working paper of the World Bank people, they're using a solid method in the absence of proper data, and they're getting numbers like 10% which is not consistent with the rest of the macro picture, right? I mean, if, if something ought to be happening, people moving out of agriculture or agriculture productivity going up quite a bit uh, for, for those kind of sharp decline of nearly 10 percentage points to happen, right? So essentially, some skepticism uh, exists and the government's not publishing the data has not helped people being skeptical that it wouldn't have looked good and that's why it was not published. So this is some, this is basically a picture of the extreme poverty. So we have it from 1980, and this is at the World Bank number of $1.90 purchasing power parity per person per day. A lot of mumbo jumbo there to non-economists. The Tendulkar poverty line is similar to that, and it's usually based on something like so many rupees you would need in a rural area per person per day to buy a certain amount of caloric needs, and from this, these numbers are then calculated, right? So you can see that until 2010 or so, there is a sharp decline in poverty. I think that's well accepted. Inequality is another matter, but extreme poverty, there is indeed a sharp decline. And then after that, that dashed vertical line shows, after that there's no data. And then what we have is, first of all, the World Bank guys who did this, basically what they did is they took the CMI data set, the Consumer Pyramid Survey, and then matched it with the NSS 2011-12 to kind of make the samples comparable. And then using the you know, private data set, they tried to guess what was happening to poverty. If you believe them, this indeed this been this black line, that's a sharp decline. And the Bhalla et al. IMF working paper shows it's about 4% or something, which would be indeed uh, uh, very, very welcome news if it was indeed true. Now, here, here I want to come to connect some of these different themes that I've been kind of you know, putting out here, fragments of various thoughts. The assumption behind all these synthetic estimates that growth reduces poverty. And indeed, in the case of Bhalla et al., they use national income statistics to just project the growth rate the whole economy is enjoying onto the incomes of individuals at all groups. We saw that's patently counterfactual. That's not true. And that is why it's useful to construct these growth rates by different income groups, right? So therefore, this is their common method. Indeed, essentially, if you look at you know, uh, uh, unconditional growth by itself is not universally poverty reducing unless it includes structural transformation. Because if growth is driven by jobs and incomes in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, and Hyderabad, it is less likely to be poverty reducing because bulk of those poverty numbers are coming from rural Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. 
you know, at the risk of, of course, many other states are there, but that's where action needs to happen. Either they need to move to the urban areas or urban areas, their relatives need to send lots of remittances or things should happen in the agricultural sector or, or the local economies there. So, essentially, if you look at the measure of vulnerable employment, um, Essentially, what you would expect, and this is another way we are kind of showing that why the structural patterns of the economy is inconsistent with a sharp drop in poverty, economic growth would indeed lead to a fall of agriculture and GDP. And another robust indicator is the structure of the labor market, self-employed versus regular salaried employment. And here, you can also look at the ILO vulnerable employment number. This is the definition of the vulnerable employment. You know, I'm happy to share the slides if you want to look it up in detail. But this is kind of the jobs that agricultural laborers, small tradespeople, sm small shopkeepers, informal sector workers would kind of have. There's no guarantee. These are the people who would hit directly, were hit directly by the uh, pandemic. So now what we show here in this graph is the black line is the poverty headcount that I already showed you. Nothing new there. But the green line is basically agriculture share of GDP. Yeah? And we also have this dashed blue line, which is the vulnerable employment line on top. right? And the point, again, I want to take out of this is, see in the right side of the picture, not much is happening. Not much is happening in terms of trends in vulnerable employment, trends in agricultural share of GDP, and yet, uh, according to the World Bank estimates, poverty rates are nose diving. Yeah? So once again, the statistics are not consistent. There's something, something has to give here. Okay? So this is another way of going at this. So what we have presented here is the following. So essentially, this is a time series from 1980 to 2021, where on the horizontal axis, we have for each country that's here, India, China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam, agriculture share of GDP. And on the vertical axis, we have the corresponding poverty. Yeah? So what you see is for all the other countries, there's a negative smooth relationship between poverty decline and decline in share of agriculture being positively correlated. In India, some miracle is happening, you know, starting 2010 or so, and you have the sharp drop in poverty, if you believe the World Bank numbers, because it's not showing up in the agricultural share. So something is off here, okay? And that's the case we are trying to build. Here we try to do this in a more formal way, and again, I will not bore you with some of the details, but happy to clarify questions. So here, what we did was we actual poverty is measured in the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we basically run a very simple regression where you predict poverty based on the following things, fraction of agriculture and vulnerable employment, right? And we predict poverty out of that. So the horizontal axis is the real one. The vertical one is the projected one. See the good fit. It fits quite well. Which are the only two years not fitting? India 2017 and India 2018, they're jumping out of the regression line. So here, whatever is the reported poverty is actually lower than what would have been the predicted poverty. So once again, these are all things that uh, you know, seem to suggest that it is difficult to accept the hypothesis that poverty has decreased sharply. So I'm nearly towards the end, and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for um, questions, and, uh, uh, questions and answer and discussions. I want to now turn to two more bits of evidence, and then we'll call it, call it, call it today. So now I showed you some of India's comparison with other countries in terms of poverty and share of agriculture and stuff. Now I want to look at within India. This graph is actually uh, quite nice, if I may say so myself, uh, because what we have here is essentially the poverty line is this vertical axis, okay? And the rest, what we have is the cumulative distribution, uh, and on the horizontal axis, we have the per capita consumption per day. If you do not, if too many jargony words, 
all it shows your, is your per capita consumption distribution and it's a cumulative one. So, you know, as you move on, you're adding those that were at a lower level, so it's the cumulative distribution, right? So with these, as is well known, if there's general progress, the whole curve should shift to the right because per capita incomes are increasing, it's not increasing equally for everybody, but the distribution should shift, right? Uh, if you look at the curve, you know the extreme right one is Delhi urban. Yeah, and this is based in 2011-12 in, in, in data from NSS, yeah? And if you look at Bihar rural, which is the green one, and the UP rural, these are the more extreme left ones. So this just shows, this is the distribution of living standards, and when that vertical dashed line intersects them, that exactly enables you to tell from that curves what is the corresponding percentage of people who are below poverty in that area. We have also thrown in rural Gujarat, rural urban Gujarat, not to just make it a Delhi uh, and, and Bihar UP comparison. So in 2011-12, about almost entire urban Delhi was out of extreme poverty. Meanwhile, half of rural Bihar and UP were in poverty. So it is better to be poor in Delhi than to be you know, relatively rich in rural Bihar or UP. You can see that from the curves, that they're, you know, really sh you know, they're, they're um, um, underlying uh, income uh, per capita consumption levels are not overlapping much, right? And the richest decile in rural UP and Bihar are closer to the poverty um, uh, than their equivalent decile in the urban Delhi. I could go on and on and on, but this is to say there's a lot of within country heterogeneity, right? And so if growth is concentrated in Delhi or urban Gujarat, it's not really gonna help where it's like to reduce poverty, as somebody said, you've got to go, I think it was President Johnson, maybe not the um, uh, best uh, person to invoke, uh, to quote, you've got to go hunting where the ducks are. So if you want to deal with poverty, you have to go to rural areas of the heartland because that's where you know, poverty can be reduced. You know, doing stuff happening in Delhi, etc. It's good, no, no harm in it, but that's not going to do it. So this is the growth in the poor states and essentially what you have is per capita income growth is on the horizontal axis and poverty uh, head count in 2011-12. I'll read the uh, sort of graph for you. The size of the circles represent population size. So a big dot or a big circle means that's a big state, okay? And in the, you know, I, I'm sure it is difficult to read, but basically the Uttar Pradesh is one of those biggest circles which is above the line, right? And you can see that there is a negative relationship which is opposite to what the standard growth framework of macro tells us that poorer regions should grow faster. We actually see essentially the following, that growth in the poorest states have been the lowest. Yeah? And indeed, if you look at basically the growth rate, uh, the per capita income level and the corresponding growth rates, the reverse shows up that those who are richer are actually growing faster. This is old, also holding in a geographic sense. So I want to again go back to the murder mystery equivalent or the crime mystery. How could poverty be going up when your only display is growth rates have not been bad, the J-shaped recovery has happened because all the supporting statistics is saying those channels are broken or not working very well. So, the last, I will spare you some of the details, but this perhaps is where we had to work the hardest to produce some uh, kind of, you know, uh, original calculations. So what we did was we basically tried to follow what Sutito Sinaroy and Van der Weide did with the CPHS data, namely match it with the NSS sample in 2011-12, and then using this other survey, try to figure out what the extreme poverty was in 2017-18. Their problem, Jean Dres and Anmol Somanchi have very convincingly argued that this is not representing the extreme poor well. They go survey where there's more economic activity in the village where there's more residential sort of things, and to the extent the poor live in dispersed rural areas, you're not gonna catch them. So therefore, that is the problem. Even if you statistically try to fit the distributions, it's not gonna do your job. And that could really be the reason why they're getting such a big drop in the thing. So what we did, and this is something that we are 
um, you know, in a way quite happy with because we believe that it provides one of the more credible indirect estimates of poverty around the time when the debate is 2017-18 is we basically use the PLFS. The PLFS is the Periodic Labor Force Survey and again some of you may not know a lot about it, others may not know it and after one hour of statistics and various terms I don't want to necessarily go into all the details but the bottom line is this is a nationally representative sample and therefore like the NSS its sampling structure is less subject to criticism than the CPHs would be. So that's their advantage. What's their disadvantage? They don't have detailed consumption data because that's why otherwise we could just simply use that to you know, uh, act as a substitute to the NSS numbers. So what Rishav and I did is essentially through a set of exercises came up with predicted consumption values using the PLFS data because their wages are a very good predictor of household consumption. So we use that relationship to generate a hypothetical NSS-like number for 2017-18. That's all we did, okay? And again, the methodology was similar to what Vander uh, uh, Sinara and Vander White did, but we are just using the PLFS to do it. So let me get to kind of the main finding from this. So this is a bit of a, you know, it's again, uh, maybe a bit involved, but essentially this is like in, you know, uh, uh, maybe that was when I was young, which was a while ago. So we had this detergent powder ads where there are the surf and then some other detergent powder, and there were various things, you know, boxes ticked and then boxes crossed. And of course, surf had all the boxes ticked. So here we are looking at this alternative data sources, the Consumer Expenditure Survey, NSO, the Employment Survey, National you know, NSO, and then CMIE, and then the PLFS. Yeah? And basically what we are ranking them are, are this nationally representative? You know, clearly the case is yes for the NSO ones and no for the private one, right? So that is where that's not great. Do they have a detailed consumption profile? Again. NSS is the equivalent of the SURF, right? Yes, it has that. What's the problem with the NSS? Is it available uh, for all the years? The problem is for 2017-18, it's not available, right? And that's why I said if you had that, uh, my talk would be just you know two, three slides and I would have to think of other things to discuss. But the employment survey is looking more promising, but it does not have the 2017-18 numbers. The CMI has everything going for it, except for its sample representativeness nationally is not convincing, and that's the main critique. So therefore, we use the PLFS because it's published, and we can have this indirect way to predict the consumer expenditure. Okay, you have been patient enough to look through all of this. So here, what we do is use our method to predict the 2011-12 consumer expenditure distribution and match it with the actual one to see if the fit is good. Because 2017-18, we don't have the NSS1 and we are believing that this PLFS indirect measure is what we're gonna be using to generate poverty. So this is a kind of basic check that whether 2011-12, they kind of match. Okay, this is the core finding. So here we have these years, 2011, 12 to 2020, 21. We have the Bhalla et al, where basically they take the 2011, 12 number and that impose the national growth rate on that and all is well, everybody is happy, poverty has been eliminated, that's the first column. The next one is the World Bank number, right? And then the World Bank Sinhara and Van der Weide number. This is where you can see that in 2018-19, it's 11%, 2017-18, it's, it's about 13.4%. Our, and then I should also mention the very right column. There was a leaked version of the NSS report that some people had access to. So S. Subramaniam of Madras Institute of Development Studies, as well as Pramit Bhattacharya, who's a very distinguished economic journalist, they did some calculations on it, okay? And based on one of those, the very last column says the 2017-18 number was actually 22.8%. So it was an increase compared to the 2011-12 percent. Again, one would wonder why the report was not published, but that was the number. 
Our numbers show it basically hovers around 20% in 2017 18, with a marginal decline to 17% in 2018 uh, uh, 2018 19. So if you now compare that with the 2011 12, that was 21%, right? So therefore, you know, we should also keep in mind, we, you know, we thought it would be slightly higher. In fact, you know, in, in one of our earlier pieces before doing the calculations, we thought it would be in the 20% range, but this is what the numbers are spitting out. And in 2017-18, it is indeed 20%. And this is interesting because 2011-12 is 21%, and after literally six years, you know, with all this growth going on, it's actually marginally less. So I want to sum up here. First of all, it's extreme poverty. So even if with our calculations, it is really 17% as opposed to say 10% of what Van der Weide and Sinaroy are saying, you might say that, look, that's still progress. Now, if you do a time trend analysis, it's still not very good progress. If you look at the poverty dips in the earlier rounds of the NSS, there were sharper dips. So even if you take literally uh, the number that we come up with, the dip is not significant. It is a decrease, but it's not a huge one. But we should also keep in mind that if one out of five Indians, that's roughly 20%, live in extreme poverty, that doesn't mean others are doing well. We saw some of the macro statistics here, and this is also something to keep in mind when talking about poverty or extreme poverty, that we are really looking at the absolute wretched uh, in the economy who are really in the subsistence, in and out of subsistence, right? And there's a vast uh, uh, section that's still pretty poor and who are not doing particularly well. I also want to say that we have no we shouldn't fight with growth. Growth is good, right? I mean, or at, at, at worst, growth is useless, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, but the problem is we should really care about it for its instrumental value in raising standards of living, right? And that's the only reason we should care about it, right? Otherwise, if a rich relative's salary goes up by you know, twice, you will say, good for him, you know, even ask him to treat you to a nice meal, but not much to you, right? So here, it really has to instrumentally affect the living standards of others, and therefore, at best, it's a partial measure, at worst, a misleading one. The fact that growth has not translated in significant decline in poverty or structural transformation over the last decade is matter of concern, not just for considerations of equity, but the sustainability of the growth path. Because eventually this will go out. You know, you, you cannot keep on how many Jaguars will people buy and how much you know, income uh, will it generate. It will peter out unless you have the, you know, uh, uh, some harmonious connection with the rest of the economy. And it also tells us there are times and contexts where the good old equity efficiency trade-off in economics is a real one, but then there are other times they may not exist or they can be relaxed. In other words, to the extent there's a harmonious effect of having the poor having more purchasing power, that is leading to demand for manufacturing goods, and that could lead to more income, that might be actually a positive thing. I would never say this is always the case, but this was the classic argument for Keynesian economics that even you, it would seem like wasteful expenditure, but by propping up the economy, it would eventually pay for itself. So I would end with the thought, again, this was, you could say that the whole exercise was really trying to understand what's happening to poverty in the absence of data. And therefore, we harnessed and marshaled a whole set of related statistics as to evaluate what are the, some of the narratives that are being given out and produce some numbers that we, we came up with. I think the main thing I would want to take out of this, and again, to some, this may not be you know, something that you have thought about, is we shouldn't fight with the growth argument, but we should treat it with a certain degree of distance because there has to be more information. And this is something, again, I have always found that when I'm in f flying in a, you know, in a flight and some business person is sitting next to me, he's saying, yeah, well, growth going on, but wages are really going up. And I usually don't have the heart to tell you that's growth for how it reaches the others. It's going up as a cost for you, but that is exactly why growth matters for the others. Otherwise, what is growth? I mean, just the profits going up would not be that. Anyway, I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.
you, Professor Kuntu, for that very rich and insightful talk. Uh, may I now request Professor Bakchi to sum up, and then we have the question and answer. Sir, maybe you could sit there and have a mic to sum up. For this densely packed lecture. I dare not sum it up for the simple reason that my, neither my eyesight nor my hearing are up to the mark. The takeaways that I take from this are several ones. One is that it is possible to have growth from bottom up. That is what you have argued. Second is that uh, the uh, inequality is not going down in spite of the fact that because by several estimates poverty is going down because among other things growth is concentrated regionally and the poorest states are growing at a lower pace than the richer ones. The other uh, ones that, that I take away from this is that whether growth is fast or not Inequality always goes uh, up. Uh, Professor Ghatok has given several different statistics for estimating poverty, and he has uh, not uh, prompt for any single one as the true measure. In fact, the late Obhijit Sen and Utsa Patnaik had have always been uh, skeptical about the official poverty estimates, including th those of World Bank. And I am myself not very comfortable with the uh, uh, statistic that poverty is going down, because by the hunger index, India has slid below all the South Asian countries except Afghanistan. These are some of the uh, and uh, the point also there is that uh, the, uh, in order to stimulate the rate of investment, which has been stagnant for quite some time, what you need is to stimulate domestic demand. And domestic demand not only for cars and refrigerators and SUVs, but also ordinary consumer goods. And that is where, again, Professor Ghatok has come down on the side of the vulnerable sections of the population. I'm sorry I cannot summarize any more than that. I'll have to read your paper properly in order to be able to absorb everything in there. But I thank you very much for presenting this very densely packed lecture with uh, all the uh, available statistics used in it and the hypothesis about the various macroeconomic factors tested properly. Thank you, sir. Um, we have some time for question answer. So I request Professor Ashin Chakraborty to maybe conduct the question answer session. Uh, if you could go up on stage. Now the floor is uh, open for uh, questions and Maitish will answer the questions. Uh, yes, Anindada. Yeah, I hope to get hold of the paper like Professor Bakhti has said and read it thoroughly. Uh, I just had one uh, query. Mm. You are, of course, looking at the different patterns of demand and different poverty estimates. Uh, can one do something like this, like uh, take the different years uh, and then look at the growth rates, okay, and then correspondingly look at the um, education and health estimates, like, for example, in education, primary uh, enrollment, dropout rates, and things like that. And similarly, maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was wondering whether, uh, you know, what you are doing is, of course, something different, but whether that could buttress the argument that the growth is not 
really looking at the social welfare uh, kind of aspect. No, I think that <coughs> it also relates to something that Professor Bakhti said. You know, as having taught uh, development economics now for several decades, I think the first lecture starts with the idea that national income is not a good measure of development for reasons one, two, three, and four, you know, non-market goods, externalities, uh, ignores distribution, et cetera, right? And indeed, then you go through the evolution of human development index, how it came up, uh, Sen and Mahababul Haq, and then also the subsequent like poverty, inequality type measures, you know, deprivation measures. Uh, you also have the multidimensional indices, and also more recently, uh, happiness measures of various kinds, right? And these all have their strengths and weaknesses and so on. So I think I, you know, where I, you know, just to engage with one of the points Professor Bhakti said, and then I'll, it relates to your point too. So I think that this is where, you know, suppose you're looking at your child who goes to school, you know, and comes back with a report card, right? And various comments, qualitative comments, how is, is she doing in arts, you know, is he social, et cetera. At the risk of sounding or displaying my, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, conservative norms, I would say onke got the basis. And, you know, and some of the more, these quantitative numbers. It is not to ignore anything, you know, I'm all, all for extracurricular things and so on. So I feel the reason I am a bit of a defender of the NSS-based poverty numbers is the limitations are obvious because it's just a money equivalent of what certain caloric things could be. There are measurement issues. Angus Deaton and Jean Drez and Utsa Patnaik had a fight on this EPW, couple of articles, you know, rich debate. And then Himangshu and Obijit Chen, and Himangshu is somebody who uh, uh, I'm actually collaborating with, you know, in part of his, he's uh, quite an expert on poverty stuff. So what we feel is it's a bit of a standard that you can compare over time, right? And just to give an example, the multidimensional poverty index, you know, people talk about it, and I have nothing against it. Sure, if people have access to, you know, fuel, people have access to education, you know, all these are good things. But where I always worry a bit that this is, you know, like in that school report, uh, your child is very social, he likes, he or she likes to play in the playground, you know, uh, yes, these are good things, but the problem with this qualitative measures is you cannot figure out what, how much of things are actually improving because the way the multidimensional things are done, it's zero, one, zero, one, number one. Number two, it's cumulative. Once you hit all the ones, so in a rich city, the very rich and the slum people will all be showing not poor according to the multidimensional index because we, they have access to a number of things. It is, you know, it is incredibly useful in other things. So my point is, and I want to then come to your specific question. So my somewhat, what can I say, folksy way of thinking about poverty is exactly how doctors evaluate us. There are a whole set of health indicators you look at, right? Now, some are very basic ones. You know, what's happening to your blood pressure, what's happening to these things. So I agree that in the end, the goal of development is not to make people or the vision shouldn't be like their passive you know consumers who just needs to be fed in a cage and that's it then that's not development i don't think any any progressive vision of development should be that but on a more operational side yes some of the things y y you are saying can be done in terms of the nss numbers in terms of consumer items but once again, the trouble there is the poverty of statistics. We, you know, after 2011, 12, we don't have much. The CPHS has numbers on educational expenses, private tuition and stuff, and the scope for looking at what they're growing and what, what, what income decile. And I welcome this work because, you know, we had a specific objective and in the end, I wanted to come up with a number and we, you know, best produce the estimates that do. But I agree with you that in some ways we need a whole kind of, it's like a cross-section of the lives of the poor. And in fact, my um, um, supervisor, Obhijit Banerjee, um, and Esther Duflo have this uh, very well-known you know, book, of course, but earlier than that, Economic Lives of the Poor, which is a very good essay that looks at these different aspects of their life. Do they have access to credit markets, you know, uh, and these kinds of things. But anyway, maybe I gave you an over-elaborate answer. 
Yes, you have a question? Yes, please. इनकुअलिटी कमाले प्रभार्टी रिडक्शन कमे कि लास्ट टेन फिफ्टीन इयर्स एम्पेरिकल स्टाडी थे कनक्लूसिव को एविडेंस आना नट नेसेसरि सेकेंड पॉइंट सेकेंड पॉइंट हे इनकाम इनकुअलिटी कमान जो इन द डेवलपिंग कान्ट्रीज टैक्सेस एंड ट्रांसफार्स एड द इफेक्टिव इन्स्ट्रुमेंट्स किंतु फर एन इमार्जिंग इकोनॉमी व्हाट कैन बी द इफेक्टिव इन्स्ट्रुमेंट्स टू रिड्यूस इनकम इक्वलिटी इट पार्टिकुलरलि क्वेश्चन ये आसे जे उइ आर स्पेंडिंग लट अफ मानी ऑन सोशल प्रोटेक्शन स्कीम्स पार्टिकुलरलि जेंडार इक्वालिटी एंड सोशल इनक्लूशन स्कीम तो दिस एक्सपेंडिचर ऑन सोशल प्रोटेक्शन डू दे हैव एन इम्पैक्ट ऑन द डिमांड पुल सैड इकोनॉमी वेदर दे आर producing some uh, demand pool in the economy so that uh, this thing can be growth of the individuals in the lowest strata that can be this is the question we will take these three questions and then uh, maitrish will answer uh, yes please uh, good afternoon uh, sir amar basic uh, observation ta data management er upor seta hocche inequality ba poverty amra jai mapi na keno एक डेटा के धरे मापा है एंड उम मे कम फ्रम एनी एक्डेमिक बैकग्राउंड जियोग्राफी डेमोग्राफी इकोनमिक्स उज डेटा टू प्रूव अ पॉइंट एबार कथा हे जो को डेटा धरी स्पेशलि हेल्थ एजुकेशन एंटाइटलमेंट एगुलो इनुकुअलिटी के कार करवार डेटागुलो व्यवहार कर मनीटर कर पिरियड अफ टाइम एट रेगुलर इंटरवल्स एबारे जो एक सबसेट अफ डेटा धरी अंडार एजुकेशन जो स्कूल ड्रप आउट इन वेस्ट बेंगले स्कूल ड्रप आउट रेट रिसेंट इयार्स सीगनीफिकेंटलि कमे गए तो एक इमिजिएट फल आउट होते तो एज एट मैरेजे चाइल्ड मैरेजे चाइल्ड लेबारे अथवा निमेरिकल लजिकल एबिलिटी एमंग द स्टूडेंट्स बेड़े जो पड़त क्यों सेगलर को एनकारेजिंग ट्रेंड है तो यार कि इमिडिएट बैकग्राउंड डिटरमिनेंट थे जमन पैरेंटाल एजुकेशन थे फैमिली इनकम थे टीचार दे कमिटमेंट थे टूअर्ड स्टूडेंट्स हमारेटुक अबजार्भेशन सर रात सबमिशन बिफोर यू जो जी ए रकम डेटागुलो के देखी तक इंडिपेन्डेंट रईट डेटा सेट हिसाब से ना देखे जो एक पैकेजे देखी इट पसिबलि रिफ्लेक्ट एन इमेज एंड गिवज अ क्लियर सीगनल बिफोर द पलिसी मैनेजमेंट दैट हुईच एट द स्टेक इन्स्टिट्यूशन व्हाट रोल दे नीड टू प्ले एट व्हाट पॉइंट अफ टाइम थैंक यू जदि एक प्रश्न कनफाइन करी अबजार्भेशन कमेंटा के एक कम करी बोध है टाइम मैनेजमेंट बेटार है मैत्रीज नाउ यू हाव थ्री क्वेश्चन एंड अबजार्भेशन प्लीज थैंक यू हमें प्रथम प्रश्नटार उत्तरे देख जेहेतु एक विशेष प्रश्न नहीं कि थियरि एवं किविडेंस ये कर एक जगह एलम एन एर प्रत्येक टैंजेंट थे एक नान अन्य दिखे चले जावा जाए रईट मैं अनेक समय एनालजी दी जो आपने एक सिनेमा देखें से सिनेमा माइनर क्यारेक्टर से तीन मिनिटर जन आ 
into you can then build a whole another film that is based on that character tarki hocche and that is interesting na mane onek shomoy amra bhabi to paths cross lives cross ittadi ha so apni jeta bollen eta khub interesting ekta angle je goribra tader daridro kibhabe bhabe ebong seta niye tara tader jibone poriborton anar kono sujog jokhon ashe ba kichu kichu change ashe seta ke kibhabe evaluate kore hm kintu amar kajer sathe directly to otar kono connection nei কিন্তু দের ইজ এ লিটারেচার অন অ্যাসপিরেশন এবং এখন অনেক সময় সার্ভেতে জিজ্ঞেস করা হয় যে আপনার অ্যাসপিরেশন কি ছেলে মেয়েদের জন্য ইত্যাদি এবং সেখানে বিভিন্ন সরকারের নীতি থেকে সেই অ্যাসপিরেশন লেভেলটা এফেক্টেড হতে পারে বাট বিয়ন্ড দ্যাট আই রিয়েলি ডোন্ট হ্যাভ মাচ টু সে অন দ্যাট আদার দ্যান মানে স্পেকুলেটিভ কাইন্ড অফ ইউনো পয়েন্টস অ্যাস টু ক্লিয়ারলি যে দেশে একটা আপনাকে এক্সাম্পল দিচ্ছি আমি যখন প্রথম দেশ থেকে আমেরিকাতে গেলাম আমার প্রথম একটা ইন্টারেস্টিং লাগলো যে আমাদের দেশে দারিদ্র এতই চারিদিকে ছড়ানো এবং আমাদের মধ্যেই আছে মানে আমরা রাস্তায় বেরোতে গেলেই দারিদ্র সেখানে সেটিং দেয় নট মে বি দ্য মোস্ট অ্যাবজেক্ট কাইন্ড বাট ইটস দেয়ার হুম সো আমার চিরকালে এটা মজা লাগতো যে আমাদের দেশের যারা তথাকথিত দক্ষিণপন্থী ও অর্থনীতিবিদ তারা কিন্তু দারিদ্রের প্রশ্নে কি বলবো ওটা যে একটা ইম্পর্টেন্ট সোশ্যাল ফেনোমেনা বা এটা নিয়ে কিছু করা হচ্ছে সেটা নিয়ে ডিসএগ্রি করেন না আপনি বাকি সব ব্যাপারে ইয়ে হতে পারেন কিন্তু আমেরিকা থেকে আমার মজা লাগলো যে ওখানে সত্যি অনেক সময় দরিদ্রদের মনে করা হয় ওদের যথেষ্ট অ্যাসপিরেশন নেই বা তারা দারিদ্রটাকে এটা একটা লাইফস্টাইল চয়েস হ্যাঁ এবং এমন নয় যে এখানেও কেউ কেউ নেই আমি রিসেন্টলি একটা প্যানেলে ছিলাম তাতে একজন বললো গরিবরা কাজ করতে চাইছে না তাই লেবার ফোর্স পার্টিসিপেশন রেটটা খুব কম আমি বললাম তাহলে ওদের পেট চলবে কি করে বলল ওই যে সরকারি প্রোগ্রামগুলো আসছে ওই যে নানান টাকা পাচ্ছে আমি তখন বললাম আপনি ডু ডু আ সিম্পল অ্যারিথমেটিক ওই যে নানান প্রোগ্রামগুলো অ্যাড করে কত টাকা হয় আপনি ভাবুন এবং এখানে ধরুন শহরে বা গ্রামে আপনাকে মাস চালাতে গেলে কতটা লাগে সো আবার গোয়িং ব্যাক টু হোয়াট আই এম সেইং যে দরিদ্ররা নিজেদের কিভাবে ভাবে আমাদের দেশে গরিব কেউ হলে তার ভাবার কারণ নেই যে সেটা তার কোনো দোষে হয়েছে কিন্তু সত্যি খুব প্রসপেরাস ইকোনমি যেখানে সবাই কিছু না কিছু করছে সেখানে নিশ্চয়ই দারিদ্রের একটা স্টিগমা থাকে কিন্তু আমি বলছি যে এটা ইজ এ হোল এরিয়া দেন মানে হয় না যে সামথিং অন উইচ আই ক্যান সে স্পেসিফিক হুম আচ্ছা আপনার প্রশ্নে আসি দেখুন ইনইকোয়ালিটি এবং পভার্টির সম্পর্ক এবং এখানে সত্যি এত এত বিশিষ্ট নানান অর্থনীতিবিদী আছেন যে আমার এটা বলতে গিয়েও কীরকম মনে হচ্ছে যে আমি যেন সাপ্লাই ডিমান্ড বোঝাবার চেষ্টা করছি কিন্তু ইট ইজ নোন যে ইনইকোয়ালিটি বাড়লে পভার্টি বাড়তেও পারে কমতে পারে আবার মানে এদের মধ্যে অ্যাস সাচ কোনো কোরিলেশন নেই এবং ব্যাপারটা তো সোজা না যে দুটো লোক আছে একজন লোককে আপনি দুশো টাকা দিলেন একজন লোককে পঞ্চাশ টাকা দিলেন হ্যাঁ এবার আপনি কিছু টাকা বাড়িয়ে কমিয়ে নানান এক্সারসাইজ করতে পারেন হ্যাঁ পভার্টি তখনই বাড়বে যে যখন ইটস অ্যান অ্যাবসলুট মেজার যে পঞ্চাশ টাকা পাচ্ছে সে যেই চল্লিশের তলায় চলে গেল তখন সেটা পভার্টি হলো এবং সেটা যদি এই কারণেই যায় যে ওর দশ টাকাটা নিয়ে দুশো টাকা যাচ্ছিল তাকে দুশো দশ করা হলো তখন ইনইকোয়ালিটি হ্যাজ কট পভার্টি বাট আদারওয়াইজ দ্য ডিরেকশান ক্যান গো ইন ভ্যারিয়াস ওয়েজ আমার এখানে দেখানোর পয়েন্টটা ছিল যে কিছু কিছু ক্ষেত্রে ইনইকোয়ালিটি বাড়া কিন্তু ইকোনমিক গ্রোথের সাইন আপনি ইউ মে নট ওয়ান্ট দ্যাট ফর আদার রিজনস কিন্তু আমি আমার ইনফ্যাক্ট প্রথমে যখন আমার পরিচিতি দেওয়া হলো এবং এখানে আনন্দবাজার পত্রিকার অমিতাভ গুপ্ত আছে যিনি যার সাথে আমার ওখানে কিছু কিছু লেখার ইয়ে সুবাদে অনেক দিনের সম্পর্ক এবং বন্ধুত্ব আমি একটা লেখায় লিখেছিলাম আপনি এভাবে ভাবুন যে আপনার রাস্তাটা যদি খুব খারাপ হয় তখন ফেরারি গাড়ি যেভাবে যাবে আর একটা অটোরিকশা যেভাবে যাবে কেউই খুব বেশি যেতে পারবে না তাই ইনইকোয়ালিটি কমই দেখাবে হুম কিন্তু কেউ খুব জোরেও যেতে পারছে না গ্রোথও কম দেখাবে কিন্তু এবার রাস্তাটা ভালো করে গেলে স্পোর্টস কার তো হু হু করে বেরিয়ে চলে যাবে এবং বাকিগুলো গাড়িগুলো একটু আস্তে আস্তে যাবে ফলে এবারে আপনাকে ভাবতে হবে আমি কোনটা চাই এবং এই যে ইনইকোয়ালিটিটা বাড়ছে সেটাকে আমি কোন পলিসি ইনস্ট্রুমেন্ট নিয়ে কাপ করব সো এইটা হচ্ছে কিন্তু আপনি দ্বিতীয় যে প্রশ্নটা তুলেছেন সেটা খুব ইম্পর্টেন্ট এবং সেটা ইন এ ওয়ে লজিক্যালি আমার এই টকের মানে হয় না বা আমাদের যে এসেতেও এটা নিশ্চয়ই হয়তো আমরা আলোচনা করব যে অত কিম মানে এর ফলে তাহলে করার কি আছে ট্যাক্স বা পলিসি সেখানে আমি আপনার সাথে একটু স্লাইডটি ডিসএগ্রি করব আমি যে বাজেটের নাম্বার দেখছি এটা কিন্তু আমার সত্যি মনে হয় জানেন এই যে সোশ্যাল প্রোগ্রামে গভর্নমেন্ট অনেক টাকা খরচ করে ফেলছে এটা অ্যাট দ্য রিস্ক অফ সাউন্ডিং লাইক আ কলেজ লেফট ইস অ্যাক্টিভিস্ট ইট ইজ আ বিট অফ আ প্রপাগ্যান্ডা আপনি যদি জাস্ট বাজেট ডকুমেন্টগুলো দেখেন মানে আমি বলছি যে ইউ মে মানে ইউ মে বি ভেরি প্রো বিজনেস পারসন বাট ইফ ইউ জাস্ট লুক অ্যাট দ্য নাম্বার্স 
এটা কিন্তু ঠিক না মানে ইন্টারেস্ট রেটে তো সবচেয়ে বেশি এটা চলে যায় হ্যাঁ আপনি যদি বিভিন্ন ক্যাটাগরিগুলো দেখেন এখন ফার্টিলাইজার সাবসিডি হ্যাঁ যে সাবসিডিগুলো সেগুলো তো অনেকটা রিচ ফার্মারের কাছে যায় ফলে এখন তা সত্ত্বেও যে কিছু ধরুন এই সরকার প্রথমে বললো যে নারেগা হচ্ছে গিয়ে পঞ্চাশ বছরের দেশের একটা ব্যাকওয়ার্ডনেসের একটা মানে সিম্বল আর কি ইটস অ্যান এম্বারাসমেন্ট হ্যাঁ এখন আপনি সাপোর্ট করুন না করুন ওরা কিন্তু নারেগা অ্যাটলিস্ট একটা ঠেকা দিয়ে চলেছে মানে কতটা দিচ্ছে অ্যাকর্ডিং টু সনড্রেজ অ্যান্ড আদার্স এফেক্টিভলি কতটা পাচ্ছে সেগুলো নিয়ে ইয়ে হতে পারে কিন্তু কামিং মোর টু ইয়োর কোয়েশ্চেন আই ডু থিঙ্ক ট্রান্সফার্স ক্যান হ্যাভ পজিটিভ ম্যাক্রো ইকোনমিক কনসিকুয়েন্সেস এবং এই ব্যাপারে একটা অত্যন্ত চমৎকার পেপার আছে কিন্তু আনফর্চুনেটলি ইন্ডিয়ার কনটেক্সটে না কেনিয়ার কনটেক্সটে এডওয়ার্ড মিগেল আছেন বার্কলিতে উনি একটা সুন্দর র্যান্ডমাইজ ট্রায়াল করেন যাতে কিছু গ্রামে একটা বড় সংখ্যক ক্যাশ ট্রান্সফার দেওয়া হয় কিন্তু ওরা নেবারিং সমস্ত গ্রাম এবং ছোট যে টাউন তাদের সবারও হাউসহোল্ড ইনকাম সাম্পল করে মেজার করছেন এরা যে খরচ করবে তার কি এফেক্ট হবে হুম এবং তাতে দেখা যাচ্ছে ইনডিরেক্ট এফেক্টটা আসল এফেক্টের থেকে আপনি যদি ধরুন একশো টাকা দিলেন আসল ইয়েটা হচ্ছে কিন্তু ওয়ান পয়েন্ট ফাইভ ওয়ান পয়েন্ট সিক্স তার পজিটিভ এফেক্ট হচ্ছে কারণ এরা খরচ করছে তার থেকে একটা পজিটিভ ইয়ে জেনারেটেড হচ্ছে সো সেখানে দ্যার ইজ পোটেন্সিয়াল আর যে তৃতীয় প্রশ্নটি ছিল এটা সম্বন্ধে দেখুন আমার সত্যি মানে এডুকেশন নিয়ে আমি মানে অবভিয়াসলি পড়াতে হয় মানে এগুলো কাজ লেখা মানে সেগুলো ফলো করি কিন্তু মানে ডেটার ক্ষেত্রে কোনো সিরিয়াস ইউজার অফ ডেটা কখনোই একটা নাম্বার দেখে তার থেকে কিছু করবে না মানে আমি যেটা বলছি যে আমি যদি আপ আমারও আজকের আপনি টকটা যদি আমি আমি নিজেই সামারি করার চেষ্টা করি এবং নট নেসারলি কি বলবো মানে খুব লডেটারি সামারি আই ওয়াজ আফটার আ নাম্বার যে পভার্টিটা কি এবং সেটা করতে গিয়ে আমাকে অনেক সার্কমস্ট্যান্সিয়াল জিনিস দেখাতে হলো কারণ যে নাম্বারগুলো দেওয়া হচ্ছে সেগুলো থেকে ঠিক বোঝা যাচ্ছে না রাইট তো সেটা করতে গিয়ে সেগুলো দেখতেই হলো তো আমি আপনার সাথে এগ্রি করছি যেমন এডুকেশনের ক্ষেত্রেই আমরা জানি এই এসার রিপোর্টগুলো থেকে যে এর আগে এনরোলমেন্ট বাড়ছে এটা খুব ভালো আমরা সবাই খুব খুশি হতাম পড়ে কিন্তু এনরোলমেন্ট বাড়ার সাথে রিডিং এবিলিটি নানান রকম এরা যে টেস্টগুলো করে অঙ্ক করতে পারছে কি না ফলে আমার যেটা মনে হয় যে দেখুন স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স অনেক সময় খুব আমার মনে হয় একটু আনফেয়ারলি কি বলবো ক্রিটিসাইজড হয় যে ওই মিথ্যা ডাহা মিথ্যা স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স আমার কাছে মনে হয় স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স আর ভাষার কোনো তফাত নেই কারণ স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স ইজ অলসো এ ফর্ম অফ এক্সপ্রেসিং সার্টেন আইডিয়াজ ইন 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 কমিউনিকেটিং দ্যাম সেরকম ভাষা দিয়ে যেমন আপনি পরম সত্য বলতে পারেন আবার চরম মিথ্যাও বলতে পারেন সেরকম স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্সকেও ভুলভাল ব্যবহার করে আপনি একটা সম্পূর্ণ মিসলিডিং কিছু বলতে পারেন আবার ঠিক করে করতে পারেন ফলে উত্তরটা হবে এবং আমি যেহেতু এডুকেশনের আপনি যে দিকগুলো তুললেন সেগুলোর সম্বন্ধে আমার এক্সপার্টিস নেই তাই আমি সেই সেই স্পেসিফিক ইয়েতে ঢুকছি না আমার যেটা মনে হয় যে যে কাজকে সিরিয়াসলি নেওয়া হয় তারা সব সময় চেষ্টা করে শুধু একটা নাম্বার দেখিয়ে দারুণ কিছু হচ্ছে বা খুব খারাপ কিছু হচ্ছে এটা বললে ইভেন আপনার যে আইডিওলজিক্যাল বায়াস এবং আমাদের সবারই কোনো না কোনো আইডিওলজিক্যাল বায়াস থাকতে পারে আমাকে অনেকেই বলে তুমি তো এগুলো লিখছো কারণ তোমার আইডিওলজিক্যাল বায়াস আমি বলি অফকোর্স আইডিওলজিক্যাল বায়াস তো অন্যভাবে বলতে গেলে দিস ইজ বট মোটিভেটস আস মানে আইডিওলজি বা আমার যেটা ইন্টারেস্টিং লাগে আমি যেহেতু ভারতের মতো দেশে জন্মেছি বড় হয়েছি ডেভেলপমেন্ট ইকোনমিক্সের প্রতি ঝোঁকটা তো এটাকে আইডিওলজি বা বায়াস বলতে পারেন এটা মানে হয় না যে সেরকমও বলতে পারেন কিন্তু প্রশ্ন হলো আইডিওলজিক্যাল বায়াস থাকলেও নাম্বারের অ্যানালিসিস যখন আমরা প্রেজেন্ট করব সেটা যত ক্রেডিবল হয় তত ভালো এবং সেখানে সত্যি যদি খুব কনভিনিয়েন্সিংলি কেউ দেখান যে গ্রোথের ফলে কিছু কিছু দারিদ্র দূরীকরণ হয়েছে তখন আমাদের প্রশ্নটা হবে সেটা কি যথেষ্ট হয়েছে আর কিছু কি করা যেত রাদার দ্যান ডিবেটিং যে না হয়েছে কি হয়নি সরি একটু ইনডিরেক্ট হলো উত্তরটা বাট থ্যাংক ইউ it's always bothered me that india's urbanization rate remains relatively low compared to all developing countries so uh, do you think and that adds another dimension to poverty rural living adds another dimension to poverty do you think you could get that rate and different rates in different states to relate to your structure here very good point and we did think of doing that and one of the reasons where this urbanization rate thing is right now at a bit stalled you know the reason the census has not 
uh, has not been published and all the numbers we are doing are some extrapolation from the 2011 census in terms of our mm. no what I'm saying is that in terms of the NSS numbers whatever in terms of the degree of urbanization uh, you know this is what you know wh which database would give you even the current rate of urbanization there is it's not available what we have are just extrapolations you know that's my point and also one of the things that some recent critics have said that the census definition needs to be modified in light of the certain changes that are happening etc but otherwise I agree with you what I was trying to do with the ag sector and non ag is exactly another way to do that would be the urbanization rate and so on because in urban areas poverty tends to be less as we saw with the Delhi graph and the, and the UP and uh, Bihar rural graph. Actually, our question is a clarification. Our first puzzle is to start with the puzzle. The puzzle is that the poverty is at the bottom, jara niche ache 50% bottom. Bottom statistic ta tai chilo. Je shere 2013 por theke mota moti ekta swan roye chhu. Manavra dekchi decline korte na. Aar top one percent te chilo decline korte. Decline korte. Akun shetar je vakha ta abhi diye chilen je je already 95% peche tar khete statistical aur je 30 peche. खटकारी खुब सोजा भाषा एक्सप्लेंेशन এবং এটা নিয়ে আমার একটা পাবলিশ লেখাও আছে ফলে আপনাকে সেটা আমি শেয়ার করতে পারি পরে ইমেল এক্সচেঞ্জ করে সেটা হচ্ছে দেখুন ওই একই কথা যে যখন আপনি যদি গ্রোথ আর ইনিকোয়ালিটি সম্পর্কটা দেখেন যখন গ্রোথ খুব হাই হয় আমরা যে নানান বিভিন্ন রিজিয়ান মানে যে এটা রিচার স্টেটদের গ্রোথ বেশি হয় হ্যাঁ সো ए फैक्टर जी लास्ट फैक्टर आपने जितना मेंशन कर चुके हैं इट टू मी इट सिंपली रिफ्लेक्स द ग्रोथ स्टैग्नेशन ग्रोथ स्टैग्नेशन हो आए ऑलरेडी बॉटम 50 परसेंट इट इनकम शेयर इन टोटल इनकम वाज एट अ प्रीटी स्टैग्नेंट लेवल एवं अमर किंतु पॉवर्टी तो ताई पच्ची माने एबार माने आपने बोलते ही पारें जे जहाँ शतेरो तहाई आठे रो बा व्हाटेवर है ना आपने की रेंज जे कोट चेंज जे गुलो तो शॉबी एस्टीमेट एवं स्टैटिस्टिक्स रे टा कॉन्फिडेंस इंटरवल है या आई थिंक पर ग्रोथ रेट ओ ओ ग्रोथ रेट है अमित आई भाव चोटर ये ना शेयर है ना हाँ ग्रोथ रेट तब उधर ना एटा 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 हाँ हाँ एटा 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 होच्छ ग्रोथ रेट किन्तु हाँ माने एटा होटा देखले अमित वो एटा के बुझ से पारी ना क्यों होच्छ किन्तु जाइ होग एटा जो दी अमित एटा इंटरप्रेटेशन माने लिटरली डिस्क्रिप्शन कोरी ए शेयर ना हैं टाटर वेल्थ जो दी वन परसेंट मारे उटा किन्तु मारत्तो का एक टा अमाउंट बाढ़ चें हैं एवं शेकर ने टा खूब गोरी ब्लॉक के जो दी हंड्रेड परसेंट बाढ़े तातो खूब किचु होच्चे ना फले कीपिंग दैट इन माइंड व्हाट इज़ नोटिसेबल हियर एंड लेट्स जस्ट फोकस ऑन दी एवरेज नील टा 
টপ ওয়ান পার্সেন্ট হচ্ছে অরেঞ্জটা যে অরেঞ্জটা দু হাজার ওই অ্যাবাউট দু হাজার পনেরো অবধি ইয়ে ছিল তার সরি দু হাজার পাঁচ অবধি ডিস্টিংলি ওপরে ছিল তারপরে ওটা ওই ছাইয়েটার একটু তলায় চলে গেছে রাইট ছাইয়েটা হচ্ছে টপ টেন পার্সেন্ট তো টপ টেন পার্সেন্ট বেনিফিট করেছে তার তুলনায় রিচদের অতটা হয়নি এবং একটা দুটো বছরে হয়তো অ্যাভারেজ গ্রোথেরও কম হয়েছে কিন্তু আমি যেটা বলবার চেষ্টা করছি কি জানেন যে আপনি যদি এগুলো থেকে চোখ সরিয়ে ইকোনমিক লজিকে ভাবেন আপনি যখন ইয়াং ছাত্র ছিলেন আপনার পকেটে যে টাকা ছিল সেটাকে টেন পার্সেন্ট বাড়ানো আর এখন আমি ধরেই নিচ্ছি যে আপনি বয়সের সাথে বা যে এক ধরনের তো সবারই আশা করা যায় যে ইয়ে হয় টেন পার্সেন্ট বাড়ানো তো এক জিনিস না ফলে দ্য রিচ শুড বি গ্রোয়িং অ্যাট এ লোয়ার রেট ফলে হিয়ার দ্য হোল পয়েন্ট ইজ অল থ্রু দিস পিরিয়ড দে ওয়ার গ্রোয়িং অ্যাট আ হায়ার রেট only during this period when the macro economy was receiving one after another same side goal the very rich also their growth rate kind of took a hit to low nine ten percent but tarbishi it's the same set of stats i'm looking at and there could be alternative explanation but that's really the argument whereas apni jodi bottom e dekhen bottom e ta basically tader ekhi rokom ache mane they are always basically you know following the their you know consisting the floor of the growth rates and once again that is the puzzling thing because normally logically apni bhabun hoy je ami porikkhay je 30 pay ar porikkhay je 90 pay 10% barano ta to ye hoy na so that is the revealing aspect of this eta india ta kora hoyeche ebar eta ami jani je onno desher gulo apnara koren ni করেছেন আচ্ছা সেগুলোর চেহারা কিরকম দাঁড়াচ্ছে মানে ইন্ডিয়া থেকে কতটা আলাদা হচ্ছে রিচদের গ্রোথ রেট ইজ টপ ওয়ান পার্সেন্ট ও টপ টেন পার্সেন্ট ইজ হায়ার দ্যান ডেভেলপ কান্ট্রি করেসপন্ডিং পিপল তো ডেভেলপ কান্ট্রি ইউএস ইউকে এটসেট্রা মোর ইন্টারেস্টিংলি ইটস ইভেন হায়ার দ্যান চায়না অ্যান্ড ইন্দোনেশিয়া the only country that beats india in this respect if that's the competition you want to uh, engage in would be south africa south africa shobai ke ekdom mane in terms of the growth of the very top they are off the charts according to the world inequalities database but ha amar kache bistarito ekta ache but tumi tomar jeta bollam je ekdom america europe er tulonay ekhane top 1% growth rate beshi kintu kichu peer country er tulonay beshi এখন ডেটার ব্যাপারে সবসময় ক্যাভিয়ার থাকে চীনের স্ট্যাটিস্টিক্স সেটা তুমি কিভাবে নেবে সেটা মানে ডিপেন্ডস অন কি বলবো মানে হয় না যে ইউ অলওয়েজ হ্যাভ টু টেক ইট উইথ সাম পিঞ্চ অফ সল্ট হ্যাঁ সিমিলারলি তোমার ইয়ের যদি তুমি মানে তুমি যদি ইয়ে করতে চাও যে ইভেন বটম ফিফটি পার্সেন্ট গ্রোথ রেটও যদি দেখো হ্যাঁ সেটা কিন্তু ইন্ডিয়ারটা ইজ হায়ার দ্যান দ্যাট অফ সে দ্য করেসপন্ডিং ডেভেলপ কান্ট্রি ওয়ান সো সেখানে আমরা যে স্ট্যান্ডার্ড টেক্সট বই থেকে যেটা এক্সপেক্ট করবো যে যে কান্ট্রি অলরেডি অ্যাডভান্স সেখানে জেনারেলি গ্রোথ কম হবে এবং বিভিন্ন শ্রেণীরও কম হবে বাট ওখানেও কিন্তু ইনিকোলাইজিং প্যাটার্নটা আছে অ্যান্ড আই আই থিঙ্ক দিস ইজ দি ইন্টারেস্টিং পার্ট যেটা আমাদের ম্যাক্রো চিন্তাকে হোপফুলি উইল ইউ নো উই উইল হ্যাভ টু থিঙ্ক হার্ড আর অ্যাবাউট হাউ টু এক্সপ্লেন Uh, Professor Rogato, to what extent do you think that the politico-economic philosophy of the present ruling class in India, in all its manifestations, is compatible with your suggestion here, the last point, your suggestion here of a rather decomposed and disaggregated approach to the growth discourse, the growth of individuals in different income and wealth classes? Short answer, not much. It's a serious answer. There is no evidence based on the actual policies that one can be very optimistic in this regard. And I have written on this, others have written on this. But no, I don't think, I would say, The only thing I would say is the Narega example or the food entitlement after the pandemic shows a certain political instinct 
that you know even though say there's a critique of all this transfer and the poor are just taking money but they're not also not being cut and we know that the government the present disposition is pretty decisive in terms of what it wants to do so there's a political reality that is keeping them at some you know there is a floor to what they can do but left to their own devices uh, uh, one doesn't have reasons to be very optimistic that would be my answer hello sir i have two questions the, so what is the role of gender specific labor force participation in the terms of economic growth and uh, specifically for late 90s or this current scenario and the second one is the more hypothetical that uh, those states are already or will be achieve the low fertility or replacement rate of fertility what will be happen in the economic growth in the near future you know to give a light hearted answer eglo sob syllabus er baire theke asche i can uh, offer you my general thoughts on this question see uh, clearly the female labor force participation and what has particularly happened in the last 10 years is a matter for concern i have seen papers for example ashwini deshpande of ashoka university has a paper with jitendra singh that basically looks at the macro pattern of india's kind of you know employment and that is not necessarily very conducive for female employment uptake you know the bangladesh type of strategy where there's a lot of these things are coming for cotton textiles and things that may have an elasticity for demand for female uh, labor force participation but i just wrote a uh, um a piece in in business standard with um um somebody who's more from the um liberal end of the spectrum because it started with a debate and discussion and we you know which is to say that look one thing also to keep in mind is what about all this gig economy and whatever one's you know moral ethical or the regulatory needs of it you know we are all realistic of it but it's an employment generator it is better to have something at the end of the day by working than nothing right so these are interesting questions and i do believe that a 8% female labor force participation in 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 which which is what i understand the current number is it is a stunning statistic and this is something that both micro macro labor economists and you know anybody interested in india should work on fertility to borong aaj thak thank you sir eto ami jani na syllabus er moddhe asche ki na ami khub mane chotoder moto ekta proshno korchi india er je poverty apni to eto kaj korechen er ki kono bishesh boishishto ache mane kono character jeta onno developed developing country er moddhe nei mane karon ki ei je persisting poverty এটার কারণ কি আর একটা প্রশ্ন হচ্ছে যে ডিমান্ড বুস্টিং মেজার্স সাজেস্ট করা হয় না আনকন্ডিশনাল মানি সাপ্লাই মানি ট্রান্সফার করা ন্যায়ের মতো কোনো এইটা দিয়ে কি এই পভার্টি দিয়ে সত্য মানে এটা কি কোনো কিছু করা যেত আর কি যদি এমপ্লয় করা যেত থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ হ্যাঁ এটা সিলেবাসের মধ্যেই হ্যাঁ একটু শক্ত যদিও যাই হোক আপনি যে প্রথম প্রথম যেটা বললেন দেখুন I don't want to make any kind of superficial generalizations karon eta ke systematically dekhte gele bibhinno deshe poverty tar ki ki dimension e differ kore ekta to ektu age ekta proshner uttore jeta bollam je dekhun advanced desho poverty ache obviously sei level ta hoyto alada kintu there is homelessness there is poverty you know so shekhane i would say one of the things is mobility ta ki ebong shekhane indiar khetre even after liberalization kichu paper beriyeche sam asher bole ekjon achen tini ebong tar co-author ra kaj korechen ei ta amar mone ekta interesting dimension je indiar khetre mobility rates have been relatively low given the spurt in the growth rate ekhon shetar uttor ki caste system e ache shetar uttor ki kichu rural urban traditional sector theke urban sector e jawar reluctance ache সেগুলো ওয়ান ক্যান হ্যাভ ওয়ান্স কনজেকচার্স কিন্তু ওয়ান উড হ্যাভ টু মানে হয় না যে এটাকে আরও রিগারেসলি দেখতে হবে আদারওয়াইজ উই ক্যান হ্যাভ কনজেকচার্স অ্যাস টু ওয়াচ গোয়িং অন আর আপনার দ্বিতীয় প্রশ্ন আপনি যেটা বললেন হ্যাঁ এটা নিয়ে তো আমি নিজেও এক্সটেন্সিভলি লিখেছি এবং এটা ভেরি মাচ 
মানে সিলেবাসের মধ্যে এবং পড়েওছি আর কি মানে পরীক্ষার ইকুইভ্যালেন দেখলে হ্যাঁ আমার তো মনে হয় অনেক রকমের যে স্কিম আছে সেগুলোকে খানিকটা সিম্প্লিফাই করে ট্রান্সফার স্কিমটা একটা ইউনিফর্ম করে দে দেওয়াটাই ঠিক হ্যাঁ কিন্তু তার মানে নারেগা সার্ভস এ ডিফারেন্ট পারপাস ইটস আ কন্ডিশনাল সেফটি নেট ইটস বেসিক্যালি অ্যান এমপ্লয়মেন্ট গ্যারান্টি স্কিম ইট শুডেন্ট বি অ্যাট দ্য এক্সপেন্স অফ নারেগা সিমিলারলি ফুড অ্যান্টাইটেলমেন্টেরও আমরা বিশেষ করে প্যান্ডেমিকের সময় দেখেছি যে সেটা ইট হ্যাজ এ ভ্যালু সো আই থিঙ্ক দ্যাট অফেন এই ক্যাশ ট্রান্সফারের ডিবেটে যেটা হয় লেফট আর রাইটের মধ্যে একটা তফাৎ অ্যাকচুয়ালি আছে কিন্তু সেটা ভুলে গিয়ে অনেকে ক্যাশ ট্রান্সফার শুনলেই ভাবে যে সেটা একটা সাংঘাতিক কিছু রাইট উইং আইডিয়া আমার যেটা মনে হয় দেখুন রাইট উইং থেকে যখন ক্যাশ ট্রান্সফার যেটা মিল্টন ট্রিটমেন্ট থেকে শুরু করে একটা তো ইয়ে আছে ওরা বলছে অন্য এক্সপেন্ডিচার কমিয়ে শুধু এটাই করা হোক অ্যান্ড দ্যাট ইজ সামথিং ইউ নো ওয়ান কুড হ্যাভ সিরিয়াস রেজার্ভেশনস অ্যাবাউট হ্যাঁ কিন্তু আপনি যদি সেট অফ ডেভেলপমেন্ট স্কিমস আছে তার মধ্যে এই যে বিভিন্ন আপনি সেই কন্যাশ্রী বা এই ধরনের বিভিন্ন যদি বলেন এবং আই এম নট অপোজ টু ইট ইন প্রিন্সিপাল ইউ ক্যান হ্যাভ আ জেন্ডার কম্পোনেন্ট টু ইট অর ইউ ক্যান হ্যাভ ধরুন যিনি প্রতিবন্ধী সেখানে ইউনিফর্ম ট্রান্সফার হবে সেটা কারণ আপনি ভাবুন না যে স্ক্যান্ডিনেভিয়া দেশের যে ওয়েলফেয়ার সিস্টেমকে তাও মনে করা হয় যে অ্যামং দ্য ভেরিয়াস ইম্পারফেক্ট মডেলস দ্যাট আর অ্যাভেলেবল দ্যাট ইজ দ্য ওয়ান দ্যাট ইজ কনসিডার টু বি আ বেটার ওয়ান essentially you pay taxes everybody files for taxes and then if your income is below a certain threshold you get transfers but that's contingent on several characteristics apni single mother kina apni employed na unemployed kina so ha amar to eta mone hoy je as much as tax dewata is a right thing to do tax paki dewata we can we can consider that this a wrong thing to do a transfer is just a negative tax so amar mote as much as taxes are legitimate transfers are legitimate too so shei argument ebong jekhane it's clear understanding je apni jokhon income threshold ta cross kore jaben tokhon apni tax deben so i really don't think this whole thing of making this as if apni eta mane doya ariye dicchen ba era boshe boshe taka ta iye korche eta amar misguided mone hoy poverty estimates are very sensitive the decline we can capture that but if you do the multi dimensional poverty as you as you have rightly said that it's cumulative and it doesn't fall suddenly right i mean the 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 access to these things doesn't uh, fall so so this this the very recent multi dimensional poverty and its decline that has put us in a in a very difficult fix in the sense that it's coming from a undp originated from undp amartya sen etc etc and now this is being invoked as something that you know 10 million people are out of poverty etc etc which you you have said that this is not the correct way of looking at poverty so what would be the kind of discursive advantage that you would have in the present uh, circumstances when actually this multidimensional poverty uh, is very difficult to dismiss because it's coming from ofi it is coming from you know sabina alkar actually you know she is uh, she has written the preface and all so no i i think that i'm going to give a first of all a bit of a provocative answer but then i'm going to give a more academic answer the provocative answer would be to draw an analogy suppose somebody is going to offer you a job and they offer you a salary package and you know they say that this is what it's going to be in 2 years whatever and another firm says we have nice coffee machines it's a nice environment access to transportation is good we offer various you know facilities which is the number you're going to first look at j you know you're going to look at j okay you know uh, you know these things are not 
unimportant. And I deliberately chose the examples that all of us would want a workplace conditions that are good, accessibility, you know, uh, friendliness to child, uh, you know, uh, raising children and flexible things. All these are good. But at the end of the day, you are going to look at the salary package uh, first and foremost. And if it is ticked, then you say, oh, this one has this better. So I would say uh, the, the standard poverty versus the multidimensional poverty, that's how I look at it. Now, of course, I haven't you know, had a chance to discuss it with some of the, and I think Martin Revalian has an article which I had read a while ago about a, a critique of that. I did find it persuasive, even though I cannot recall all the details there. But now I'm going to give a more academic and in some ways a more proper answer. But it's you know, related to my more um, uh, argumentative answer, the first one, which is you know, going back to that medical analogy. I certainly do if all people say is how much people are eating, then we could be in a centrally planned economy where people have very limited uh, scope for doing anything, right? And yet sort of consumption levels are rising. Is that development? One can well say that, that that's not development, right? And Omar Tushin himself has said this about whether you're able to choose the bundle that you choose as opposed to somebody just giving it to you and, and you, you having that. So I would say that, honestly, I would like to look at both. So therefore, but this should not be posed as substitutes. And it is not difficult to guess the politics behind one set of poverty stats getting a lot of publicity versus the other set of discussions kind of getting labeled as you know people who are skeptics or critiques of the government somehow grum grumbling about this. Whereas, as I said, that we all have our political and ideological biases. But as much as you know, our doctor could be a very left-wing person or right-wing person, but you would hope that he would use the measures that are accurate measures of your health and then take a, you know, whatever, give prescribed medication on that. So on those things, I would say responsible discussion or something uh, should combine both. And I'm sure there would be people already thinking about combining them. You know, that's what the social choice uh, folks uh, kind of often do, that they come up with really nice ways of, you know, indices that can combine the hard and the soft, if I, if I say it in those terms. Much. Uh, so, Suparna will now close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now come to the end of today's program. I want to start with thanking Professor Hopper for his excellent talk. We all really enjoyed it. Uh, I want to thank, we want to thank Professor Bakchi for being here today and for always being an inspiration. It was a great pleasure to have Professor Nyanji as well. We want to thank everybody in the audience, some old friends of IDSK, some new friends. Um, and lastly, I want to thank the staff, students, and the faculty of IDSK. Thank you very much, everybody.